So as you all know, we are now in the 32nd Sunday of the ordinary time. So that means we are about to close another liturgical year. There are, of course, 34 Sundays in ordinary time. On top of that, we have, of course, the other seasons, special seasons of Advent, Christmas, and then Lent, and then Easter, uh, and, and back to the ordinary time. So we're now in the 32nd, so 34, two more Sundays to go. So usually the last few Sundays uh, of the liturgical year talks, or they talk about the end times, the things that will happen in the end. We call it in theology eschaton. Uh, there's a subject in theology, eschatology. I think I almost failed. <laughs> I don't want to remember that, but uh, <laughs> because it's hard. Oh my God, you, know, you read a lot, you, of course, the book of Revelation and all of that. So, uh, so we, we talk about the end things, the end things. So next Sunday, spoiler alert. Uh, so next Sunday we'll talk about the coming persecution because Jesus, of course, he, he would foresee what's coming for his disciples and his followers. There will be great persecutions and people will be discouraged and some would even run away from fear because of fear of you know, persecution. But he said, be strong and do not worry how you defend yourself. You don't even need to prepare anything. It will be me through the Spirit who will be speaking in, in my behalf so don't worry you don't need a lawyer you don't need somebody to defend you just trust and then of course the final Sunday of the liturgical year is the solemnity of Christ the King that only means one thing that at the end of time Jesus will reign as King of Kings and Lord of Lords so this Sunday, being the 32nd Sunday, we talk about something that's very important, something central to our faith, and that is resurrection. Resurrection. That is, you know, without the resurrection, our faith is in vain. Nothing would have meaning if Jesus did not rise from the dead. But we have to remember that in the Old Testament, the idea of resurrection was not developed. Nobody talks about resurrection, what it means. You know, for the most part of the Old Testament, resurrection was not something that people talk about or believe in. It was only towards the end of the Old Testament, after the Jews returned from Babylon, uh, that they started to realize that, yeah, there is life after this life. It was because of the infusion of the Greek influence in the Jewish culture. Because the Greeks, they, are, they love knowledge. They want to learn many things. You know, philosophy, astronomy, science, physics. They are, you know, great philosophers are Greek people. And so the infusion, the merging of cultures, they soon to realize that it is important to think about what's next after this life. Is this all that it is? And so the books of uh, wisdom and the books of wisdom and Maccabees, they're written in Greek. And it has really some Greek influence in it. And so we hear from the first, our first reading today from uh, the second Maccabees about these seven brothers uh, that sacrificed their lives. They were willing to die than disobey the law of their ancestors, essentially the law of God. For them, they had their hope that God will give them the gift of rising from the dead and they will live forever they said you can cut my hands here go ahead you can cut my tongue come on cut it I don't need it you know God has given me all my faculties but you know God will restore it you can kill me now but I'm not worried because the king of the world will make sure that I will rise again and live forever and for you our executioners there is no resurrection for you in the next life. That's very beautiful. And that's kind of just towards the end of, of the, the Old Testament. And the book of Maccabees written around 175 years before Christ. And now the gospel. The gospel talks about, you know, the gospel of St. Luke talks about the, the, a group of Sadducees. The Sadducees are, they are, oh, 
uh, they are what we call, they are the uh, Jewish, uh, uh, members of the Jewish aristocracy at that time. And they're also members of the Jew uh, one kind of Jewish uh, priesthood. And they were considered the arch conservatives at the time of Jesus. And for the Sadducees, what separates them from the others, like the, the Pharisees and the, the scribes, is that they don't believe in the resurrection. Why? Because for them, it's only the written law of Moses, the Torah, the first five books of the Bible. For them, that's, that's it. No oral tradition. Oral traditions, some Pharisees believe in oral traditions. For them, it's only the law of Moses that really matter. And in that you know, set of books of Moses, there's no talk about resurrection. For them, resurrection is not possible. And so, just to ridicule Jesus and to ridicule about the idea of resurrection, they put forward a hypothetical question to Jesus. And the question is very logical. You know, if you think of it, it's almost impossible, but it could happen. There is a chance that it could happen. Now, in the Jewish law, if you marry a woman and you die without having a child, your brother will take on the woman to be, you know, uh, her husband. And you, the next brother or the brother, will raise posterity. You know, they try to have children in order for the brother's name to continue on living within the family. And so... The question is, a woman married a man, the man died, and so the brother will take on and, you know, marry her, and he died again, and all seven of them died. What did she do? I mean, that's crazy. How, how did she do that? But I saw a hypothetical question. So, all of them died now at the resurrection. This is the crucial point. At the resurrection, whose wife will she be? Remember, all seven married her. So, just to ridicule the idea of resurrection and the belief of resurrection, I said, all seven, will she be the wife of the first brother, the third brother, or the seventh brother, or the most handsome brother, or the most, you know, the richest brother, or the most behaved brother? Who's, whose wife will she be? Or is she going to be the wife of all seven brothers? How, how is she going to uh, manage seven husbands? You who have one right now, are, are you managing him well? <laughs> huh? I mean, that's a question. <laughs> yeah, so it's, it's not, it's like, but it's possible, it's logical. But here comes the, ge uh, the genius of Jesus, of course, you know, God as He is. He said, you know, you are mistaken. People in this age marry and remarry, you know, as what you see it, what you experience. But people who pass on from this life, they are immortals and they no longer marry and re they don't need to reproduce. Only humans do that so that we will propagate and fill the world with God's children. But in the next life, there's no more marrying and remarrying and no more children or having to raise a family. Everybody becomes an angel, like an angel. But first, we will dwell on this because the idea of the Sadducees is like, for them to ridicule this idea of the resurrection, is like, for them, they think that the next life is a continuation or extension of the present life. But for Jesus, no. He said, no, you're badly mistaken. It's not an extension. It is a transformation. Everything will be transformed. And we have no idea how that will happen. We become angels and children of God. It's interesting because angels are always referred, in the Old Testament, angels are always referred to as children of God. And so being an angel can also be called a child of God. And so in the next life, this is, the next life is not an extension of this life. We will totally be transformed. We will become angels. We become children of a loving God. Now, you know, how is that possible? It is possible because it's God himself. You know, like uh, uh, a, a, a human embryo, right? You know, uh, the fetus become before it becomes a fetus, like a human embryo. It's if if you're not a doctor of a gynecologist, you would not know what it is. You know, it, it's it's if it can be taken out of the mother's womb, and and you look at it, what is that? I, I don't know what is that. It's a flesh or a blood or something like that. You don't know that, but it's human being. And how come the embryo will develop and grow into like me and you, all of us? How is that possible? possible because it's God. The transformation from an embryo to a human being is amazing. It's amazing. I, I was a chaplain for 12 years. I've seen these things. Not that I, you know, 
do things, but I know, you know, we, we, so we have, you know, seminars and we have all of these things. That, so it's amazing how these things can develop into what we are. And so imagine from us being humans, we become angels. We don't even know what it's like to be an angel. But that is the truth. We become angels. We become children of a loving God. And that is the only thing that really matters at the end of time. The only human relationships and titles that we can ever have in our lives is that being called a child of God. We have titles. Some of us are doctors, lawyers, engineers, chief of police. Uh, we have, you know, priest, a bishop, a cardinal, a pope. Uh, you know, we have superheroes. Uh, we have superstars and basketball players. Uh, the home, uh, homecoming queen. Uh, we have. I'm the valedictorian of my school. I am the CEO of that. I'm the director of that. We have all these titles, and we love these titles. I am a mother, I am a father, I am a brother, I am a sister, I am a grandma, I am an aunt, and an uncle. Those, those are beautiful things in our relationships. But in the end, they don't matter. What really matters is something even more powerful, even more special. And that is to be called a child of God. And we have no idea what it means when we get there and become an angel and a child of God. St. Paul reminds us of this very beautiful thing. And I think we're going to sing it. Yes, we will sing it. Uh, he says in, in his first letter to the Corinthians, chapter 2, I think verse 9, if I'm not mistaken. You can correct me right now if I'm wrong. He says, No eye has seen, no ear has heard, no human mind has ever imagined what God has prepared for those who love him. And that's a very powerful statement. No eye has seen. We have never seen anything. Oh, wait, probably we will never be able to understand. No eye has seen. No ear heard. No human mind has ever imagined what God has prepared for all those who love Him. We're, we're our, our, our being humans were, were so limited. That's why at one point in his life with his apostles, Jesus said, there are many things I want to tell you, but you can take them now. He wanted to so much tell them what to expect and what's going to happen, but you can never take it now. In other words, it's just like a newborn child and explain to that newborn child the laws of physics. You know, you know how this works, you know, with physics and all of that. They, the child can never, I mean, the toddler, a baby, newborn child can never understand what it is. Just like us, we're here, we're so limited in many ways, and there's so much to be understood, to be discovered. And that is the gift of the resurrection of Jesus, given as hope. The main ingredient of our hope is the resurrection of Jesus Christ, which one day, if we remain faithful, we will share with Him, and that we will have life eternal. And in that time, Probably we will say and thank St. Paul when he said, No eye has seen, no ear has heard, no human mind has ever imagined what God has prepared for those who love him.